Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Elisa Baker? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. I'll start with the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Elisa Baker was born on June 6, 1968. She was raised in North Carolina. Her parents worked in textile mills and furniture factories. Elisa had a history of deceptive behavior and manipulation starting at a young age. She rebelled against her parents in her teenage years. Her mother responded using physical force. Her mother appeared to be the disciplinarian, and her father was more laid back. Elisa was popular in high school, but dropped out before graduating. She struggled with obesity. At one point, she weighed 300 pounds. Lisa was married six times when she lived in North Carolina. She was married in 1985, 1987, 1992, 1995, 1997, and 1998. Lisa did not always divorce a husband when she left. During one three-year period, she had three husbands simultaneously. As far as her marriages, her behavior followed a pattern. She would often target men with physical disabilities who had trouble finding romantic relationships. After causing physical and financial harm to her husband, she would leave and sever all ties. By 2008, Elisa had a series of small claims judgments against her, liens from landlords, as well as bills from utility companies and other companies. She had 42 different addresses over the previous seven years but was unable to escape her own irresponsibility and recklessness. People were starting to catch up with her. She was looking at some consequences. She decided to find an address that was farther away. She moved to Australia. This takes me to the background of Zahra Baker. Zahra Baker was born in Australia on November 16, 1999. Her father was Adam Baker, and her mother was Emily Dietrich. Both lived in Wagga Wagga, which is in New South Wales, Australia. After Zahra was born, Emily suffered from postpartum depression and gave Adam custody. Adam, his daughter, and his parents moved to Queensland, where Adam worked in a sugar mill. Zahra had a number of medical problems, including bone cancer in 2005 and lung cancer later on. Part of her left leg was amputated, and she lost some lung tissue. In addition, the chemotherapy negatively affected her hearing. She wore hearing aids. Adam Baker and Elisa would meet on a social media site. Elisa traveled to Queensland to meet Adam. They would marry a few weeks later on July 8, 2008. Elisa, of course, was already married to someone else at this time. This same year, Zahra's cancer went into remission. The family moved from Australia to the United States. They lived in a few towns in North Carolina, eventually ending up in a trailer park in Hickory. Zahra attended public school for a short time until reports of mistreatment were made to the school. Elisa was the alleged perpetrator. She pulled Zahra out of school and indicated she would be homeschooled. At this point, Zahra was in fourth grade. Child Protective Services visited Zahra's home many times through the course of investigating four separate complaints. Elisa was well known to the Department of Social Services she had been investigated about complaints related to her biological children starting in 1999. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On October 9, 2010, at 5.30 a.m., Elisa Baker called 911. She reported a fire behind her residence. The police arrived and found a fire in the Chevrolet Tahoe owned by the company that Adam worked for. They extinguished it quickly. They also found a ransom note. At 2 p.m. that same day, Adam Baker placed a 911 call. He said his daughter was missing. The last time he saw her was 2.30 a.m. He found a ransom note for $1 million on his company SUV the night before. It was addressed to his landlord, a man named Mark Coffey, but Adam believed the kidnapper made a mistake and took Zara instead. Adam said he found the note when there was a fire in his backyard. He suggested that the kidnapper may have used the fire as a distraction. The next day, the police brought in search and rescue dogs to search the baker's house and vehicles. The dogs gave a positive alert, 
indicating they detected remains on not only the Chevrolet Tahoe, but a sedan owned by Elisa. She was arrested for a variety of crimes, like larceny, driving with a revoked license, and writing bad checks. These are crimes unrelated to Zahra's disappearance. When Elisa was in jail, she admitted that she wrote the ransom note. She was additionally charged with obstruction of justice. Elisa's lawyer contacted the authorities on October 23, 2010, and said that Elisa would tell the truth in exchange for a charge of murder in the second degree. The prosecution agreed because at this point they didn't have a body and they really didn't have much of a chance of getting a conviction against Elisa. Here is Elisa's story about what happened. Zahra died on September 24, 2010. This was not a murder. She died from an illness. It was unexpected. Adam dismembered her body, and Elisa and Adam worked together to dispose of the remains at various locations. They both came up with the kidnapping story. In November of 2010, Elisa led the police to various locations so they could find Zahra's remains. From the bones that were recovered, it was clear her body had been dismembered. The police also found a prosthetic leg near a road just a few miles from a place where Elisa used to live. They confirmed it belonged to Zahra. The police were skeptical about the story that Elisa and Adam worked together because only Elisa's cell phone was near where the remains were found. Elisa called Adam nine times on September 25. The police reasoned that she would not have called Adam on the phone if he was standing right next to her, as she claimed. The police came up with a theory that Elisa Baker murdered Zara on September 24 and disposed of the body the next day. Elisa was working alone. In February of 2011, Elisa was indicted for second-degree murder with aggravating circumstances. Adam Baker was never charged with murder, The police do not believe he was involved in any way with the homicide. In April of 2011, he was charged with obtaining property under false pretenses and identity theft. Adam actually accumulated a number of charges prior to this related to a few different activities, including making threats, writing bad checks, failure to return property, and assault with a deadly weapon. Adam returned to Australia after being convicted of several charges unrelated to the death of his daughter. Additional charges were filed against Elisa Baker as well, including seven counts related to drugs. Elisa was also charged with a bigamy. In September of 2011, Elisa Baker pleaded guilty to secondary murder and was sentenced to 14 to 18 years in prison. In 2013, she was convicted of conspiracy to distribute prescription drugs. She received a 10-year sentence for this, which she can start serving after finishing her sentence for murder. Now moving to my analysis. Elisa Baker gave an interview to 60 Minutes Australia some time ago. She said that she found Zahra dead on September 24, 2010. She conducted CPR for 30 minutes, but she was unable to resuscitate her. Elisa indicated that only an evil person would commit the crime that she committed. She explained the multiple husband situation by saying that she thought her husband had filed for divorce. She had more difficulty explaining why she introduced her ex-husband as her brother. It's interesting because in an interview with one of her former husbands in North Carolina, he said that he didn't want to divorce her because he was afraid of her. So some of the failures to divorce may not have only been the fault of Elisa Baker. Elisa's interview was peculiar. Her mannerisms were not congruent with the heinous nature of her crimes. It's like she really didn't understand the gravity of what she did, or she was trying to convince people she did not understand. She tried to make it seem as though she loved and cherished Zara, and Adam was her Prince Charming and honest. What was the motive for Elisa Baker's crime? Elisa never provided a clear motive for her behavior, not the mistreatment or the homicide that occurred later. One theory is that both Adam and Elisa wanted Zara to be out of the picture, Adam was cleared of any involvement in the homicide, but perhaps he was indifferent toward his daughter, and Elisa picked up on this. Maybe Elisa thought that if she killed Zara, Adam would not object. It seems unusual that Adam didn't report his daughter missing for over two weeks. Another theory is that Elisa did this without considering anyone else's feelings at all, like it didn't matter if Adam was indifferent or not. She was just going to do what she wanted to do. 
What does the research literature tell us about what could have been going on in a case like this? The crime that Elisa committed is referred to as maternal filicide. Even though 90% of offenders of this type are biological parents, step-parents are 100 times more likely to commit this offense. There are five main motives for this offense. Accidental, the mother was committing a crime but didn't intend to cause death, like she took her mistreatment too far. Altruism, the mother commits the crime out of love. Unwanted, the mother looks at the victim as an obstacle to her goals. Acutely psychotic, the mother has hallucinations and or delusions. And the last type is revenge. The mother wants to cause harm to the father. This almost always involves a custody dispute. In the case of Elisa Baker, it would appear the motive was that Zara was unwanted. Elisa committed the crime on purpose, so it wasn't an accident. She did not appear psychotic. She had no reason to desire revenge. And the altruism motive doesn't fit based on Elisa's character. Moving to the next question, what are the risk factors for this offense? We see a number here. Being a full-time caregiver, a low educational level, young age, many offenders are in their 20s, a history of mental disorders like depression, substance use, psychosis, and personality disorders. When psychosis is present, persecutory delusions are the most common. We see low intelligence and a marital status of single. When comparing these risk factors to Elisa Baker, she was a full-time caregiver, or was supposed to be, so that one matches. She had a low educational level, another match. She was a bit older than what is typical. Her history of mental disorders is unknown, but of course many people theorize that personality pathology and substance use are possible in this case. Elisa does not appear to be particularly intelligent. Her marital status was not single. She was actually married to a few different people at the same time. That's not even a category that's measured in the studies because it's so rare. I can see Elisa trying to check off a form with questions about marital status and getting frustrated because there's only one checkbox available next to the word married. When considering all the evidence, here's what I think happened in this case. Elisa Baker was self-centered, deceptive, manipulative, sadistic, and lacked empathy. She told several people that she wanted fame and fortune. Her focus was always on her own needs. She selected vulnerable men so that she could control them. She always wanted to have her way. At some point, she decided that Zara was an obstacle to her goals. She murdered her for this simple reason. It may have also been that Zahra's condition was attracting too much attention, empathy, and compassion. Lisa became envious. The only reason Elisa confessed is that she was afraid that Zahar's remains would be located and then she would be charged with first-degree murder. She would face the death penalty at that point. I think she cooperated with the police only to avoid being executed. Zahra Baker had an incredibly difficult life. Everything was stacked against her. She suffered tremendously. On top of all that, she encountered Elisa Baker, the one horror she could not survive. Those are my thoughts on the case of Elisa Baker. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.